So here is the statutory warning before I say that the talk is to raise a lot of questions but not necessarily provide answers. Okay, so here is a summary of uh, what I want to say. Now, underlying all solution concepts in games, there is uh, some, some notions of rationality. And perhaps the most fundamental one is iterated elimination of dominated strategies. And this is already challenging for games of infinite duration. But, you know, there is some body of work which says recently that, uh, okay, you can extend these to infinite games. But uh, there is some tricky stuff involved. This is when we go into games of infinite games of imperfect information, the situation is quite unclear. And uh, the kind of infinite epistemic structures that arise complicate the construction of type spaces, which is very important for giving foundations for rationality in game theory. So the, that's all. So this is really all I want to say, that uh, the situation is so. The aim of the talk is really I'm confused and I want to spread my confusion and hope that uh, you know some other people have some clear thoughts on this. So I don't think uh, there are good uh, positive results to show, but it's more to discuss some kind of work in the area. And uh, much of it is by other people, but I have done some little bit of work that I mentioned as well. So it's not a report of one particular piece of work, but talk about problems in the area. That's really what I wanted to do. Okay, so the underlying assumption of classical game theoretic analysis, players interact in an ideal world, players are perfectly rational, some rationality postulates, they have perfect knowledge about all possible strategies of all players, and they have unbounded computational resources, and common knowledge of rationality holds. That means that the, that's a basic assumption where every player is assumed to be rational, and every player knows that every other player is rational and iterate this infinitely. And equilibrium theory typically talks about existence of stable strategies. That, so you can think of it as a prediction of play that what players would do. Stable in the sense that you look at whether a player is likely to switch away from whatever equilibrium predicts. Now the notion of strategy, to go back a bit, comes from Emil Borel, 1921. And in fact, well, there are uh, people here who can try to translate it. It's really a method of play, according to Borel, which von Neumann copies, 1928. Now, von Neumann's seminal paper, this 1928, is a, a very nice paper that I like. And it, he has this uh, section titled General Simplification. In fact, he first apparently wrote it as Great Simplification. And I think the editor objected and he changed it to general simplification. So, the, and it lays out a full development of the idea. So what he says is that, look, if you're looking at the dynamics of the game, you might as well forget about the, all the dynamics. What you can do is, once a move for every situation <coughs> conceivable by the player is specified, a rational player may ch well choose the strategy before the game begins. And this idea he attributes to Borel. And uh, so the idea is that, so this is what is called normal form games. So once you have a space of strategies, don't worry about how the strategy is constructed, right, in the tree, right? If, uh, oh, it's, but of course, it's important that whatever you're talking about in the strategy, it tells in all possible situations. If you know how a player is likely to play, if that you can specify somehow, that's, you just look at a space of such strategies and choose one among them. A rational player may well choose to strategy. Now, what is this before the game begins? This means that before any consequences of other players' decisions can be observed. And, you know, there is a, a sentence of von Neumann there where, you know, for those who can read a bit of German, it very clearly says what he has in mind. And this turns out to be very important for the way game theory develops at that point. And von Neumann Morgenstern, you know, is built on this. So the main idea is that every player must choose his or her strategy without being informed of the other player's strategy choices. And that gives you a presentation of games and strategies. Now this notion of strategic independence was developed by von Neumann, consistently applied by Nash. In fact, what you can say is that von Neumann came up with this notion, von Neumann, Morgenstern, take it up, but really actually applied for 2% zero-sum games. 
Now, when you go to multiplayer games, there is a lot of transferable utilities, a whole lot of other stuff comes, and they don't really consistently apply the principle. It's Nash who really took it up. Nash actually, you know, takes it very seriously and uh, defines, and that's what we get is this notion of Nash equilibrium. So, idea is to simply equate a player with a set of strategies. I mean, you don't care about anything else about a player, it's simply a set. And the process of selection of strategy and player completely ignored. And now, if you're thinking of any computational theory, this idea that that set needs to be equipped with some structure, and in the particular context that we are looking at, what kind of structure that we want to equip it with. That's been the main. So, on the other hand, if you're interested in the theory of play, I'm not going to talk too much about it, maybe towards the end. What you want uh, is an advice function that tells a player how to play, a prescriptive theory, and then you want for resource bounded players. Then strategic choice would depend on observations made during the play, and it should constitute response to observed behavior of the other players. And the kind of observational strategies that we have been listening to, to today in many contexts are all things of this kind, which game theorists would call typically theories of play, not so much uh, reasoning about games, but reasoning inside the games. Okay. Why is all that relevant? So we'll see more as we. So one thing you can say is that strategies are probably better viewed as relations constraining moves rather than as complete functions, total functions. Now, an example is heuristics employed, employed by chess playing programs where you are not giving moves for every possible situation because enumerating them is too difficult, but you just give some uh, heuristics that constrain moves. Okay, so can one come up with a framework where strategies are specified as structured objects in some built in some compositional fashion, what kind of structure you have, and what I would really like is some library of a player having a library of partial strategies and you know, and compose them on the fly. But anyway, these are all like wishful, some kind of wish list. And we are now, good, what we are going to talk about is games of unbounded duration, and we want to talk about reasoning in games, not about games, and framework instead of extensive form games. Okay, so this is just some general jazz to say that uh, we are not only interested in uh, infinite plays, but also uh, finite plays of unbounded duration. So one of the things is that um, there's a lot of work in game theory to talk about what are these unbounded horizons? Do they, do we equate them with infinite horizons? Or, you know, what's the difference between finite but unbounded play and infinite play? So you want to think about these things as well. Anyway, I'm not going to have much to say. This is just okay. So I'm, I want to get to iterated elimination of dominator strategies, which is going to be the main thing that we'll talk about. So here is a little crash course on the basics of ga game theory. So those who know all this very well, please forgive me, but this is just to get us going. At least Professor Parsarathy is not here to embarrass me. So he's an eminent game theorist who was there earlier in the morning. So, okay. so fix the set one to n to talk about players. And so our idea of a strategic game, so that's what we're going to discuss quite a bit of for a while, is you have n non-empty sets of strategies, and you have a payoff um, payoff functions for each player, where from the set of strategy profiles, which is simply the product of the strategy spaces for the n players, to the reals. So this is the strategic form. And in general, s minus i denotes the tuple of the profile of whatever other players the opponents have. And this is this, the basic notion. A strategy si for a player i is a best response to whatever the opponents have. If for all si prime, that is, if whatever choices, so you fix opponent behavior, assuming that the opponents are going to play these, this is the best response that I can think of. Right? It gets the, the maximum payoff. Okay? The payoff that I get with the si is greater than or equal to any si prime. And you say a profile is said to be a Nash equilibrium if for all a, si is a best response to s minus si. So simultaneously for every player, assuming that the other players play s minus j, sj is the best response. And you say a profile is Pareto efficient if there does not exist any profile s prime which gives better payoff to all i, at least as much payoff, and at least for one person is better off, right? You say that s is Pareto efficient, that means that you can't find any other profile where every player is at well off, at least as much well off, and at least one player is better off. 
if you can't find any such thing then that's what you call pareto efficient and in general pareto efficient solutions is what people are interested in and uh, so and the basic principle of rationality is that of dominance and we say that si strictly dominates si prime if again now here what you are talking about is this is not for a fixed one and what you are saying is that for every choice that you have for the opponents that you have got the payoff that you have here is strictly greater you say dominates if this is simply greater than or equal to that's a uh, this is a general inequality this is a strict inequality and you say si weakly dominates si prime if you take whatever are the strategy strategies for the opponents then what you are saying is that uh, uh, player i is better off with si and there exists at least one scenario with the opponents where you are strictly better off this is weak domination and you say that a strategy is strictly dominant if it strictly dominates all of the strategies and uh, the basic principle says and of course then you can talk about a strategy being weakly dominant or dominant yeah any weak domination is a stronger condition than dominance yeah that's a way terminology yeah and uh, so the basic idea is that a rational player would never choose a strictly dominated strategy this is the in some sense you can say this is you can take as the defining principle of rationality in strategic form games that uh, any questions about the definitions this is this okay now the in general you can say that well why would you wh what do you mean by that in general a player doesn't get a better pay off by switching from a dominant strategy to another if you have already got a dominant strategy you know there is no real incentive to switch from that and so if you have a profile such that si is dominant for all i every player has a dominant strategy then surely it's an ash equilibrium because it's in fact the best response um, for for every player right to the opponent now this conclusion also holds when each si is weakly dominant now what about the converse the converse if si is strictly dominant then s is a unique ash equilibrium if uh, if you got a profile where each si is strictly dominant then you can easily show okay and the converse of the above is not true now there are a series of little statements here because i know that there are several people from my game theory course sitting here so these are all propositions to prove and if you have not proved it, it you should prove it so now let me see what else yeah maybe weak dominance weak dominance is a much more uh, much uh, more tricky one maybe before i go at least one example so here is an example of game so now you can see that t is weakly dominant for row player right and uh, l is r right l is weakly dominant for for column and of course tl is a nash equilibrium but then there are more nash equilibria right tr bl are also nash equilibria right so in general if you are looking at uh, weakly dominated strategies weak, weakly dominant strategies doesn't give you um, all the equilibria that you might look for so this connection between these is something that's uh, important to note but 
in the case of strictly dominated strategies, it's very clear that we want to <coughs> eliminate them because uh, a player is not going to play any strictly dominated strategies. And the basic procedure that we use is to, iterate it, uh, to iteratively remove strictly dominated strategies. Because the player is never going to play that, you might as well get rid of it and then look at a reduced game. Once again, there will be some, if there may be some strictly dominated strategies, you want to eliminate it and you want to keep doing this. And so this is the basic idea, the basic procedure, you can say, for talking about uh, rational, predicting rational behavior. So iterated elimination of strictly dominated strategies, either simultaneously or in some order. Right? Because there can be lots of them. Now, which one are you going to eliminate? So that is the question. So there is a procedural question that is involved here. So in general, so fix some subset of strategies Ri. And now we say that you talk about a restriction of the game. What is the restriction of the game? Where for every player you have talked about some smaller set and this restriction is naturally defined. And now you can talk about a reduction between restrictions. R uh, strictly reduces to S prime. If S prime results as a result of some removing some strongly dominated strategies, strictly dominated strategies. This is strongly strictly. Okay. I use both. Okay. So when is it? R is not equal to R prime. That means you have eliminated something. And for all I, you have got a subset here. And uh, if I, if you have removed something, it's because there exists some other thing that was originally there which strictly dominates. Yes, so you have removed only something for which there is a something uh, strictly dominates is available. And this is justified by the assumption of common knowledge of rationality. If you look at it, what you are using is the principle of common knowledge of rationality here. If you take rationality to be the f fact that a player would never play a strictly dominated strategy. Now, in gen now what are the things that you can say about the solution? Right? What you got left with? Take a game G and after some finite set of moves, I mean a finite set of uh, elimination like this, you have got a restriction. Now if it is the case that there is no further restriction that is possible, then you say this is an outcome. An outcome is one where you have iteratedly removed strictly dominated strategies until you cannot do any further. And if you find that you have left with a single turn for every player, then you say that the game is solved by iterated elimination of strictly dominated strategies by the procedure. Now, what are the properties of this? Okay. So in general, I start with the game G and I apply this procedure until I cannot, I get G prime. Then we can show that every Nash equilibrium of the original game is a Nash equilibrium of the reduced game. What about the converse? Converse is generally not true. If G is a finite game, that means what? The strategy sets that I was starting with were all finite sets finite sets of strategies, then any Nash equilibrium of G prime is also a Nash equilibrium of G. So for finite games, the original game that you begin with and the reduced game that you are looking at have the same Nash equilibria. For infinite games, generally this is not true. If G is finite and solved by IESDS, the outcome is in fact a unique Nash equilibria. So the, this procedure is very nice because uh, for finite games at least, if you end up with single terms, you know that what you have got is a unique Nash equilibrium. Now, but that's in general not true. In the case of infinite sets, no. So, already the difference between finite games and infinite games starts cropping up in the very basic level. That's what I'm pointing out. But of course, with infinite games, the story is much worse. Now, you can ask, is the outcome of this procedure unique? I said you can either remove them all simultaneously or do it in some order. Will we get different outcomes if we do it in different order? And so is strict dominance order independent? Now, this was not very long ago. It was only in 1990. It was shown that for finite games, all uh, these uh, different orders yield the same outcome. And uh, Duffenberg and Sigmund 2002, where they showed that order independence does not hold in general for infinite games. And uh, 2007, Apt had a, a theorem where showing some kind of order, independ order independence with some monotone restriction. So it's in general not true that, that 
So this is one of the first important things that I want to make a point about. So if you're going to look at uh, infinite games on finite graphs, whatever, games of infinite duration, first thing to watch out for is that even if you have, luckily, a situation where your uh, iterated elimination of strictly dominated strategies gives you an outcome, in general, it can be ordering. It can be dependent on the order in which you do things. What does iterated mean? Yeah, so we'll come to that. I'm just saying, no, but it's very clear now with just the presentation that I've given, right? It's just a set. I gave you n sets, and I gave, see, look, so far, there was no finite assumptions anywhere. I just started with a tuple of strategies and started the whole thing, right? N sets of strategies and I said, so these are just infinite sets. I had no cardinality assumptions anyway. I should have mentioned that. I never said finite. I'm specifically saying things for finite games here, right? The point being that in terms of, what are the properties? In terms of properties, you see the difference, right? Here, this is just a relation. It's just a relation between restrictions. All you are saying is that I start with the space of strategies and I'm making looking at subsets by removal, right? So this is infinite. I remove some finitely many strategies and I get another infinite set. I keep on doing that. The point is that if you ever arrive, right? So look at the property. So I'm that's why I'm being careful here. I'm saying if you've got an outcome, right? If G prime is an outcome of G, then that preserves Nash equilibrium, right? And I'm saying in the finite case, it's the same thing. There is no problem. But in the infinite case, what is the situation now? It may be that you could have, uh, you know, Nash equilibria in the new game, which were not Nash equilibria in the original game. Right? That's possible now. That construction is not uh, very trivial. But I want to say more things, so I'm postponing that. Right? There are more problems anyway, so this is one of the problems. Right? So how much of these you will get to weekly dominance? I'll come to that also. Yeah, yeah. So, Huh? Yeah. It's order? I'll, I'll come to it. Just give me a moment. Right? Let's first, I'm saying, see, the point is that in terms of rationality questions with strictly dominated strategies, there is no ambiguity at all. I mean, if there is one thing that game, game theorists all have a consensus on, that is to say a rational player would never pick a strictly dominated strategy. You change the notion even a little bit, there is a lot of disagreement among game theorists, so, you know, for a variety of reasons. So I don't want to get into right? So weak dominance comes with all kinds of problems. So, but my point is that even here with infinite games, we have problems to worry about. Right? Now, question is, uh, which are the desirable properties, right? So do we want this or not? Uh, do we want to preserve exactly the Nash equilibria or some other equilibria? That's something that, you know, the research should tell you. But I'm just telling you that if we take Nash equilibrium as another important concept, then there's the relationship between these. Right. I want to get to backward induction, for instance, a little later, which is also justified using procedures of this kind. Okay, so order independence is something that you do have for uh, at least finite games and infinite games we don't have for strictly dominated strategies. So here is a game. Okay, here's a, you know, with infinite games, it's a lot more fun because, right? So here is, what is the strategy space? Set of natural numbers for every player. What is the strategy? You select a number, whatever you pick is it, right? That's it, a one-shot game. Right? In this game, every, every strategy is strictly dominated, surely, right? In fact, we can remove in one step all strictly dominated strategies, being left with nothing. Or we can remove all strictly dominated strategies different from zero in one step. In which case, we will be left with a nice Nash equilibrium. Or we can remove exactly one SDS in each step, in which case it will never terminate. Right. So this is to point out that, of course, this, I know, do you want such game? Nothing is ruled out, right? By my definition, it's a game. Right? It's an infinite game. And uh, so if you are looking at infinite games in general, Bizarre stuff is waiting for you. Uh, if you're looking at regular infinite games, there's you know more structure that will make use of. But I think I have some more examples to talk about, but it can wait. Oh, I have some examples of removing dominated strategies, but we'll skip that. Okay. So the let's get to weak dominant. Suresh wants desperately. 
So now the in general you can define a reduction relation for weak dominance. I'm not going to write it. It's very similar, you can set and do. And now you can ask if G prime is an outcome of removing weakly dominated strategies, what you can show is that if G in the in the finite case, what you can show is that whatever is the new Nash equilibrium in the new game, it is a Nash equilibrium of the original game. But the converse is not true, even in finite games. If G is finite and solved by i.e. WS, that means what? If you, you eliminated weakly dominated strategies and luckily ended up with singletons, then it will be a unique, uh, it is a Nash equilibrium. Even, in fact, even in this case. Outcomes are not unique. Some Nash equilibria can in fact be eliminated. So let's see, here, here is an example of that. Oh, that is there. No, but I have some more points to show. Minus one, one, one minus one. So this is uh, this is matching pennies extended by one more option, namely that it falls on the edge, right? <laughs> so it's matching pennies. So if uh, you get if you get the same player, the row player wins, and the column player loses, and if the outcomes are uh, different then uh, row player loses and column player wins. And in this case, both people lose if it falls on the edge, right? I mean, okay, why not? Yeah, so if you take something like this, here is the only Nash equilibrium. I mean, matching pennies doesn't have a pure strategy Nash equilibrium. That's why you have set it up. So this is the only one. And um, for each player, this is the only weakly dominant one, in fact. Right? So if you eliminate it, you, you'll be left with nothing. What you are left with is, an ashic, is not an ashic room at all. Right? So this is one problem that you've got. So here is one more. With weakly dominated strategies, the thing gets weird, pretty weird. I'm sorry that it doesn't erase very well. So it's a perfect recall blackboard. So. You can see everything from the first talk. So here is another little example. So top and bottom, left, middle, and right. And the payoffs are 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. So what are so here is a game, and uh, the Nash equilibria are T L, B L, and B R. Oh, yeah. Now, if I apply the weak domination, the only thing that R is the only one that I can get rid of. And I get uh, LMTB, and uh, I, at this point, I can get rid of both B and M, and I'm left with TL. Right? So. Point I'm making is that here is one where if you remove all the weakly dominated strategies in one shot, what happens as opposed to doing R first and doing in the second one? Yeah, it's only two. No? Okay. 
So th there are lots of problems with uh, weakly dominated strategies. And of course, when you get to infinite games, the situation is much worse. The other uh, notion that is much studied, and perhaps the one in fact, which I like best, is the never best response. So one way and... Uh, sorry? Which one? Let's see, maybe it is. Yeah, of course. Yeah. By the way, two can't move the MR. Oh, sorry, I'm only confused with the, with the lines. I'm fine. Uh, no, no, but assuming that uh, you're going to pick it, should be okay. I wanted to do red for the first player, which doesn't mean anything. I think it's done. Okay. I just read the wrong side. Yeah. So, another notion that is considered in the literature, in fact, Meyerson has developed uh, quite a bit of stuff with this, is to eliminate strategies that are never best, never best response. If it is not a best response to any opponent's strategies at all, why consider it? This is the idea. Right? And the reduction here is the same. R prime results as a rem result of removing some never best response strategies. Right? And so you can write the whole thing. And outcomes of um, the never best response have the same properties as stri strictly dominated strategies removal with respect to Nash equilibrium. What I mean is that for finite games, if you do this never best response removal, um, the Nash equilibrium of the reduced game are exactly the Nash equilibrium of the old game. Infinite games, that's not true. And if you happen to be left with singletons, that will be a unique Nash equilibrium. So here is an example of eliminating never best response. So I'm just going to take these, give these examples of these finite games, of these little ones, and for infinite games, I'm not. I'll just tell you, can't do anything. About this. So. so here is a so there are three options: A, B, C, X, Y, two, one. 0, 0, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 1, and 1, 2. <coughs> so note that C is NBR here. Playing C is never a best response to anything that the opponent does. So, okay, so here is a, that's something that you can remove. And A is the unique best response to x and uh, b is the unique best response to y. Um, okay, so uh, let me just, uh, now I have to speed up a bit to tell you that. So once again, point is that for finite games, there are some notions of uh, basic rationality that are well studied in the game theory literature. When you move to infinite games, in general, there are only negative results in these. And this is, uh, like I said, Apt's paper in 2005. That is to show that uh, this process is order, order independent for finite games, but not for infinite games. So, and this is one reasonably, this is TAC 2005, so it's not very old. Okay, what about mixed strategies? So, this is a particular class of infinite games, right? Where you start with finite games, but the strategy, the infinite strategy space is generated by using probabilities over, by mixing the finite strategy set. So, for this particular subclass, of course, there is a lot that is known because this is what is dear to game theorists. And you can show that iterated elimination of strictly dominated mixed strategies. So, what do you, what do you want to do? You eliminate pure strategies that are strictly dominated by some mixed strategy. Right? And similarly, you can talk about Elimination of weakly dominated by pure strategies, weakly dominated by a mixed strategy. So here again, I have one little example. Sorry. You can do it here. Two, one, zero, one. This is symmetric, so you know that that's going to be OK.
bottom. <coughs> now look at B. This is not strictly dominated by either T or M, but in fact B is strictly dominated by half T plus half M. Right? So here is a pure strategy that is strictly dominated, remove it, this idea. But the rest of it is the same and I am not writing the relations because there is a bit of a mess, notational mess involved, but I assure you that the theory lifts neatly, I mean whatever I have been talking about and the properties are very similar. But you can empty everything, no? I am sorry? You can remove everything, you can take the matching pennies like that. Why? No, that is not clear, no, not at all. Matching penny, you get in fact the unique Nash equilibrium. Okay. Half, uh, half H plus yes, half T. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, yeah. Okay. But that's because it has no pure, it has no equilibrium and pure strategies. It should go. Right. Right. So, in game theory, in general, a mixed strategy profile of opponents is referred to as a belief of player I. Okay, so this is another thing. Normally, when you talk about constructing beliefs, this is the, what you are talking about. Pure strategy combinations are called point beliefs. And now we can now consider a procedure for iterated elimination of strategies that are never best response to any joint mixed strategy or belief. And this is the idea of construction of type spaces. I will talk a little bit about it towards the end. So for finite games, this procedure has properties similar to IESDS. Infinite games. Um, if an outcome is reached in finitely many steps, then a profile is an any of the reduced game, if and only if it is of the original game. Now, so as I said, for this is not for, I didn't say infinite games here, I'm, I'm saying infinite games of this particular kind, right? So, this is a particular subclass of infinite games for which something is known. Okay, so I think it's high time I switch to. Okay, so in general, relating notions of dominance and best response is not easy. So clearly, every strictly dominated strategy is never a best response, but the converse is not true. And there is no relation between weak dominance and never best response. I mean, strictly, uh, you can show games on both sides, one is better than the other. And there is a very nice theorem by Peirce in 1984 about uh, relating domination by pure strategies and mixed strategies, right? A pure strategy is strictly dominated by a mixed strategy if and only if it is not a best response to a mixed strategy. And a pure strategy is weakly dominated by a mixed strategy if and only if it is not a best response to a totally mixed strategy. There is one with full support where every option is chosen with pro positive probability. This is, a, this is a very tricky proof. It is a short paper with really terse this thing. There are better proofs by Friedenberg and uh, Brandenburger recently, in the last few years. So, but this is one of the uh, very difficult theorem to prove something like this in general for mixed strategy. Okay, so point I want to make is an analog of something, any of these for if you want to look at regular infinite games is very hard to prove and that is really where I want to get to. Okay, infinite games on finite graphs. Well, we have talked, I, I do not want to define anything now because it's all been defined and used by people in earlier talks. So, but that is what I want to talk about now. So, games of infinite duration studied in automata theory and typically win-lose games between two players, turn-based, game arena is a finite graph and the game is the tree obtained by unfolding and strategies are now maps from player nodes to incident edges and uh, in the tree. So, one thing, another procedure that I should have talked about earlier in extensive form games is backwards induction. It is the basic procedure and justified by common knowledge of rationality, common belief in rationality to be precise. And uh, of course, a priori there is no backward induction procedure for infinite games. Now, what is backward induction? You have this finite extensive form game. You know the payoffs at the leaves, right? So, at any non-leaf node, you look at whose turn it is to play. It is a turn-based game and if there exists, Whoever is in control, if there exists one leaf where the player is winning or take the maximal payoff, say that is what that for that node. Promote it, keep going up, you will do. Now that is for finite games, you can start with leaves and go up. What about for infinite games? Of course, there is not any. Now for parity games, there is a construction due to Dietmar and uh, there is for Muller games with payoffs, 
Sunil and uh, Soumya had a result where there is a kind of a backward induction argument that you can give. The idea is that these are regular infinite games, so even though you see an infinite game, there are only finitely many isomorphism types of subtrees that you see eventually. Right? So some kind of finite unfolding you can do, after which you can cut off the tree. The idea is that whatever you are going to see afterwards, you have already seen before. So for instance, uh, in their paper, it is the that LAR construction of, uh, I guess, originally Gurevich and Harrington. So the LAR provides a data structure by which you can actually uh, decorate and find out at what point everything is going to repeat, cut it off, and on the cutoff tree, you can do backwards induction. This is the idea. I mean, there is a bit of technical stuff involved, but you can do. So my point is that, okay, here is at least one procedure that you do for finite games, which you can lift for infinite games. Question is, I am more interested in what all things you can do, how far you can go, and what kind of rationality assumptions underlie in these things. So this was one exercise that was part of that thing that we were doing. Uh, but backwards induction comes with its own problems. Maybe I'll take one little example to show, or no, There's another example that's probably more interesting. So another is subgame perfection. Now maybe I'll take an example and then show. So in regular infinite games, I, I have only very small examples to talk about. So, so here is a, an example from Michael Ummels. And uh, so it goes something like this. So this is a two-player game, as was used in the last talks. Circles correspond to player one making a move and squares correspond to player two making a move. It's a two-person game. So the game looks like this. Player one has control, can transfer control to two, or stick here in a self-loop. Here two, again has self-loop here. So it's a game on a finite graph, and you have infinite plays. And you, this, here is an interpretation in the story. I mean, there is an underlying story. So there is a shared resource, and there are three players. Okay, player three has, you know, staying outside the graph. Poor player has no control node at all, right? At the mercy of players one and two. So player one, right at the beginning, can give choose to give access to two and three. or give control to player 2, pass control to player 2. And uh, <coughs> here, then player 2 can simply give access to the resource to 3, or uh, share with 1. And apparently, this is some resource, uh, part of some resource sharing protocol and so on. I refer to Mel's. I don't know whether to believe it or not, but I presume there is one, some protocol. Okay. So what are the winning conditions? This is a win-lose game. And the win winning condition is one wins if uh, five is visited infinitely often. Two wins if four or five is visited infinitely often, and uh, three wins if three or four is visited infinitely often, because that the player gets access to the resource. That's all. Now, if you analyze the game here, there are two Nash equilibria. What are the two Nash equilibria? Sorry, I'm always missing this. We should get more of these fellows. So one is where player one transfers control to two, and two gives control to, I mean two moves to node five. Okay. In this case, one and two wins. Another one where 
start with one, moves to four, and uh, player two um, goes to three. This is also a strategy profile. That's a Nash equilibrium. Two, three, win. Right? Question is: Is this a rational solution? I mean, if player one is going to make move to doing this, player two might be better off actually sharing the thing, you know, going down. Now, but this is exactly the question that's raised by uh, this notion of strategies. But remember that in terms of our notion of strategies, best response that we have defined, this is perfectly fine and it's indeed a Nash equilibrium. So that's why there is this notion of subgame perfection. A subgame perfect strategy profile is optimal for every possible initial history of the game, including those not reachable in equilibrium play. And this was uh, called behavioral strategies. Kuhn developed an extensive theory of it. And there is a great theorem of Kuhn where he shows that every sub finite sub extensive form game has a subgame perfect equilibrium, and uh, including with mixed strategies. Okay, this is the important point here. I say finite games here, but and so for infinite win lose games over finite graphs, what is in fact it's not clear what is the right subgame perfect notion because now what you are talking about is that uh, you know this, these infinite subgames, right? So what are the strategies that you are getting from there that you compose to get strategies over the game? It's not clear at all. I mean, I have my quarrels with the way it's defined in these particular papers, but the point is that that's quibbling. The main point is that there is some appropriate notion that you can define, and you can show that Nash equilibria exists, subgame perfect equilibria exists, and hold for Borel objectives. You know, Soumya was defining all these. So there is a way you can lift the theory for win-lose games. For Muller games with payoffs, subgame perfect equilibria, in the sense that we can define, need not exist, but one can algorithmically check whether given a graph whether they exist or not. So here is another. What about iterated elimination of strictly dominated strategies? For regular infinite games, this is very tricky. The outcomes are generally called admissible strategies. And it's not reasonable. See, there are many problems here. Suppose we want to start eliminating strictly dominated strategies. Now, you, you can talk about two strategies and one strictly dominating the other. right? Now, you don't want to eliminate a strategy unless some other strategy that eliminates it, that dominates it, survives. Right? You would like to make sure of that. But this is not easy. The elimination procedure may in general need infinitely many steps to stabilize. Because as you go on, you keep iterating. When are you going to stabilize at all? Will you stabilize and when? And this is uh, Dietmar Berwanger's theorem, which says that the set of iteratively admissible strategies in an omega regular graph is regular. And also, importantly, he shows that, see, here is where I think the real difference comes. For finite games, a whole lot of stuff is known. For a particular subclass of infinite games, namely those generated from finite games by mixing, a whole lot of stuff is known. But if you take countable sets of strategies, right, where you have infinite games, infinitely many strategies, but the strategy sets are countable, it's very difficult. And here is a, this is one paper that gives a theorem that says that if I work with countable strategy spaces, whatever they are, the procedure actually terminates. There is a fixed point, and the fixed point you can reach at some ordinal. You can actually compute that. If it so happens that you are starting with these as the strategies were from our omega regular graph, they have an automaton representation. That construction given in the paper is non-elementary, but recently there is a work giving a P space algorithm for actually constructing these admissible strategies. So if you want to think of admissible strategies as providing a solution, then that's very important because uh, you're not just looking at uh, some particular procedure. You want to know, not, you don't just want to know that there is a solution at the end. What is the quality of the solution, right? For example, I can think of LTL specifications and say that uh, they hold for the admissible strategies, right? Using admissible strategies, I can you know, achieve an outcome. And this is the sort of thing one would like to do. Now, strategy profiles that survive iterated elimination of never best response are said to be rationalizable. And rationalizable strategies is really something that the game theorists have spent a lot of time on. Again, for infinite games, this iterated elimination is tricky. For general win-lose games, they need not terminate. The procedure does not feature one can prove. This is something that I have been doing. 
mainly rather than admissible strategies look at rationalizable strategies and uh, pretty much one can prove a theorem of the same kind saying that at least for Muller games with payoffs we can show that uh, rationalizable strategies are in fact regular and uh, one can show that they do not feature so called non credible threats this is important for the list. Uh, but, but formally this is a property every rationalizable strategy in a sub game is the restriction of some rationalizable strategy in the original game so in fact uh, I would say that this is a better notion than some game perfection that we want to use so because what you are saying is that right on top the strategy that you pick see what is rationalizability if you think about it I am in the game tree somewhere right oh, it's on the other side so rationalizability is about the following way of thinking informally this is really what is going and to me that's why it's very interesting so the player is at this node and rationalizability says that I want to know what is how I arrived at this history right now there are various possible strategies that the opponents might be playing but I would so given my observations or whatever right I mean so given the history I want some explanation of so rationalizability says that I look at potential strategy profiles that may have led me to this right and opponent behavior and for them I constitute the best response in what follows this is the best way to think about it and this is the kind of profiles that you want to construct so this is one thing that we can prove what about mixed strategies the related notions for mixed strategies for games over infinite graph I mean games over graphs is far less clear over concurrent game structures some results exist on almost sure winning strategies existence of Nash equilibria is shown Krishnendu Chatterjee and co-authors have developed a whole body of work some results on mean payoff games but in general there are no clear iterated domination procedures nothing of the analog of Peirce's theorem exists for these that I know of at least at last imperfect information for games with information sets for players where you want uh, uh, strategies to be uniform again you can do the same thing now the important problem here is that information sets need to be presented finitely and typically by restricting to observations of players this is what Bastian was talking about in the morning some you can think of it as every player has some colors and you are only looking at the colors on the nodes now for win-lose parity games in which one player has perfect information and the other player does not a kind of subset construction is possible to determine the winning regions in general these games are not determined for games with three or more players determining the winner is undecidable and uh, the most interesting question is about what kinds of epistemic uh, what kinds of epistemic structures are there so what does each player need to know about what other players know uh, when you're working with information sets now even for coordination games where you're thinking of a grand coalition all players are working together against a player whom you can call nature there are infinite hierarchies of higher order knowledge are necessary and this is something that was shown by uh, Dietmar Berwanger and Lukas Kaiser in a paper in a few years ago now the point is that the information that each player acquires at any finite stage can be represented effectively but may require unbounded memory to maintain this derived knowledge during infinite play and this really complicates the structure so if you want to ask uh, okay before if you want to ask the question like uh, how do I do iterated elimination of strictly dominated uniform strategies right in fact that would be the corresponding notion that I can think of it's not clear at all how uh, you can do for example uh, I, you know what I was in fact trying to do was uh, start with a omega regular graph where you've got these observational strategies I mean observations are given and you want to show that iterated elimination of strictly dominated strategies the outcome is regular right but this seems to be difficult to prove mainly because as I said you have this infinite knowledge structures basically you seem to need unbounded memory and but it's um, well there are no characterizations that I know of but been spending some time on that but uh, almost all the corresponding questions that I was talking about for perfect information games we can do something at least but uh, with imperfect information games the whole thing seems uh, quite open for example some characterization of admissible strategies 
characterization of admissible uniform strategies, characterization of rationalizable uniform strategies, one would like, but almost nothing is known. And then about type spaces. Okay, so type spaces is what uh, in the in games of inf uh, games of imperfect information. This is what is used. By, this is called the Harsanyi type space, and that's what is used to give uh, constructions for. Uh, uh, I mean, for instance, Harsanyi's theorem in uh, imperfect information case using Bayesian updates. But what is the? I'll just give you the definition and tell you the sort of thing that we want to do. So, you type space is given as you take any extensive form gain, right? A type space over n is a tuple where you've got some compact topological space representing the set of types of player, right? And then you have this function that assigns to every type and every tree node a probability distribution of the set of opponent strategies that potentially reach node s. That is, this is what I said. I am at node s. I look at what are all potential opponent strategies that come here. So this is what is called the belief structure okay, in uh, Harsanyi type theory. So this is basically the player's belief. Right? I am at this node right, I, of a particular type. I am, I am of type u. I am at node s. This is what I believe the other play players are playing with some appropriate probabilities. Right? And uh, this is this. Delta x in general is set of probability distribution of x with respect to the Borel sigma algebra. Anyway, so this is the notion and uh, this is all the completeness theorems in game theory are with respect to this. Now, if you are going to <coughs> build a similar thing, what we want is for infinite games of imperfect information, we want to come up with some appropriate type space in which we want to do things. And my particular interest in this is rather than, you know, so this, this is all done for working with mixed strategies, right? For the particular class of infinite games which are those started where you start with finite games and use mixed strategies, this is what is used. If you want to look at pure strategies, but for games of infinite duration, what is the right thing to do? And I would like to do this as a, com you know, where the functions are computable functions, right? Rather than as continuous functions that you are looking at here. <coughs> so what we are interested in are computable or logically definable type spaces. Now, one thing that I have been working on is some kind of a definable type space where what you do is the set of player types are given by formulas and uh, so you've got some set of satisfiable formulas over the tree that you're working with and here this says that these are the beliefs of player i about the opponent implied by the type alpha. The rest of it is the same. So what you are saying is that I completely uh, replace it, the elements of that compact topological space and continuous functions by some formulas and some computable functions. And what we can do is to actually characterize rationalizable uh, strategies using some, so when the entire <coughs> type space is definable in a particular logic, using tree automata I can characterize the type spaces. So this is, so for one particular case at least one can uh, give some kind of regular rationalizable strategies. But it sort of stands in isolation relative to the rest of the thing. <coughs> so, okay, so we have presented a bag of, I would say, seemingly unrelated observations on infinite games and basic point is that standard notions of rationality on finite games pose very interesting challenges when we extend to games of infinite duration. Notions like admissible and rational strategies are fundamental to game theory but are not characterized as yet for games, uh, especially on regular infinite games. For games of imperfect information, Elimination of uniform strategies poses a singular challenge. I would say this needs a deeper understanding of type spaces and epistemic structures than what you've got now. I think uh, we need to develop a much finer understanding of the type spaces that we need to work with if we have any hope of proving any of the basic results at all of, uh, that are known in game theory for uh, infinite games of imperfect information, even for the regular case. Okay, that's it. Thank you.